Well, ladies and gentlemen, whether we realize it or not, we are already at the end of an era. This is the end of what's been a very tumultuous year in Rainbow Six and in the world in general, but something that we've had to specifically stomach today was realizing that this is the end of the North American dream for the rest of eternity, and there is absolutely no way we are going to be able to bring this back. Hi, my name's Jacob. He is Jesse. This is the North America Major Official Copium Post Show. Uh, I don't really have words. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, it was tough. Jacob, it was really, really tough. NA shit the bed. We didn't do anything. SSG finally pulled out a win in the end, but oh my god. What a terrible day. We literally lost seven games in a row. How does that happen? We won an SI like twice. <laughs> and that was all we did. We've never won a major. We won like one minor that we one won time. Pro League finals once. Yeah, well, yeah. And the one time we we had a dream hack was where Jarvis and Gotcha were still on the team. That kind of shows uh -huh. you how far gone we are overall as a region where we have to cycle back to 2019 success to figure out if we're still relevant or not. Undefeated um, in the NAL, though. True. But Don't we forget. still suck. We still just. Yeah, a little bit. Hi, by the way, we are the NAL Analyst Duo, and if you're wondering why we're so sad about North America not doing well, it's for that exact reason, because we had some pretty high expectations for North America, and then everything we've just seen slip gradually in front of our very eyes. Not helped, least of which, by the way, that OXG is not fighting at full capacity, and we've got, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Sonics are not playing the way that they, we thought that they would. Dark Zero are playing exactly the way that I thought they would for just this first day of the Major overall, um, and it's, it's created a lot of pain. I'm more honestly in pain over the fact that I had to get back up again at two o'clock to catch the first games because cycling back to an EU time schedule is wrecking my internal clock. I don't know how we managed to do it. I may or may not have taken a nap and you're going to have to figure out through which game I took a nap because my notes aren't as good as the rest of them. But uh, yeah, welcome to the post show. Jacob, I feel pretty accomplished actually with my sleeping schedule. I went to bed yeah. at 7 p.m. last night. Kind of skip all of uh, skip the CL finals. Don't say tell you, the CL you skip boys. the most important game of Parabellum's career. <laughs> Listen, I'll I'll VOD review him next week. It'll be fine. We'll get the we'll get the analysis done. But no, oh, right. uh, the the morning was a little rough still, uh, even for me. But uh, I mean, the the opening games didn't really help much. I don't know. We're gonna dive right into the games right now. But I think we started with a seven zero on uh, on B stream, a seven one on A stream. Is that what it was? It wasn't great. I think uh, no. no, we had a seven one. Uh, on that stream, seven one seven two. That's yeah, what it was. yeah. So that that, that that sandbox game will obviously be the one that we talk about first. Oh, hold, hold on for a sec, Tango. Right, take that away. We don't need that yet. Get out of it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so. For those of you who haven't tuned into a post show before, obviously Jesse and I ran this during the Six Invitational this year. It was a lot of fun. We ran it for around an hour and a half or so, so that's that's about the length that we're going to try to keep things to. If you run a little over, that's obviously our bad. But there is a lot of stuff that we want to get through. We ran it for the Invitational. We did every single game overall. I took one stream. Jesse took another. Um, for all of groups, Jesse's doing all the games from Group A. I'm doing all the ones or uh, from Stream A. I'm doing all the ones from Stream B. Uh, and this is entirely designed to be as much of a companion piece to the major as we could make it obviously neither one of us are in sweden working the major with our colleagues but we did want to do something that was still running in parallel to everything that was happening on the major and you guys really seemed to like it back when we did it for the invitational so we wanted to bring it back the way that this works is super simple we'll run through the standings real quick uh not in one second and then we'll go through every game as they came up on stream. So we'll start with Jesse, then we'll come to me, and then we'll go back and forth for each one, do a little bit of recap, some analysis, some of what we saw, because if for some reason you were you weren't getting up uh, at 4 a.m. Eastern to catch those games when they first started and you kind of want to catch up on how everything went, that's what this is designed to be. And obviously it is recorded live on Twitch, so if you want to show up for it live as it happens, we are recording it right now. So get your high YouTubes in chat if for some reason you want to get those in, uh, and then it'll be up on YouTube after. After the fact so yeah anything you want to say before we kick off no i think uh this is just you know this is our show for the north american fans that are just like actually have lives and can't ruin their entire sleeping schedule for a video game tournament so <laughs> this is for you this is what we get paid for though even though we're not getting paid for this this is still our job no. so we figure we, we might as well ruin our sleep schedules anyway because what other job do we have to wake up for right however if you sub to twitch.tv slash caliber jacob then at least one of us will get paid <laughs> Use those Twitch Prime subs in chat. All right, but right you know now. what? But actually, before we get started, do you want to do you want to plug something real quick that you've got running on your socials? 
Yeah, I think I will, Jacob. So what's going on uh, in my world while this uh, major's happening is I'm running a prediction competition uh, in my Discord, the Big Brain Club, to see who in my Discord can become the, the smartest cookie, um, the prediction champion. And uh, if that sounds like fun to you, then uh, you can join the Discord, you can play along. If it doesn't sound fun to you, but you want cool shit, then you can still join in and play along because we're giving away tons of prizes. The overall prediction champion is going to win a free esports jersey uh, of your choosing. If you're is coming it, in uh, now, a custom one. I mean, whatever you'd like. Sure, I don't care. Wh why not? Uh, as long as it's not like a thousand dollars, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you join in now, you'll you'll probably still have a chance. You'll be a day behind everybody else. But like, since playoffs are worth more than group stages, you should be okay. Um, and there's also daily prizes, and I wanted to announce the champion of today's daily prize, Jacob. Ooh. We had uh, 16 games. The winning prediction was 13 correct matches, and it was a two-way tie. We flipped a coin to see who gets the actual prize. It was between <laughs> Mr. Mango Trump and Panada, who both got 13 correct guesses. Panada became the champion, so I'll be hitting up your DMs later if you're watching to give you the free skin code for the Valkyrie Esports skin. Fun fact, you know who got second, Jacob? Who? Flynn got second place. Austin Twitman Rody got second place. And Boxy, as well as some other names, all wow. finished second place. So, so some, some tough competition, but they were all beaten out. So I had no idea that Flynn was still alive. That's actually cool. Actually, he did come into the he came into the CL stream last night, and he was like, "Because uh, Kool Aid uh, was Kool Aid DPRK dot PB when he played in the CL games last night," and he was just like, "Why does he have North Korea in it?" And we're like, "No, it's Democratic Repe uh, Democratic People's Republic of Kool Aid is what it stood for." Exactly. So that's the first time I've seen Flynn like since he had a birthday <laughs> tweet. So uh, Jesse spanned his Discord link in chat. If you would like to go and participate in that on the daily, go and uh, go and join that as he mentioned it's something that he'll keep on running uh, presumably with watch parties right because i saw you with a couple people yeah we're doing watch parties too um usually it's me and my mods and whoever wants to come hang out so also if you want a buddy to watch the major with we're hanging out we're watching the games we had like we had probably at the most i think like eight or eight or nine people nice so okay. yeah, it was fun it was good it was chill it was chill Sweet. Go ahead and join up in his Discord and also follow him on Twitter at JesseJChick if you're interested in getting more details about how that works. But we do have stuff to get through for today. So let's go ahead and talk about standings. We'll run through each individual group first, and then we'll start talking about how these games went. So we begin everything with Group A. Obviously, uh, this is the one part that we weren't able to get done before the show actually started was our standings graphics. So we'll just have to take the Liquipedia screenshot for right now. But only team to get... Six points overall in this group was FaZe Clan, but the thing about this for FaZe Clan, look at how many rounds lost. That's right, nada, nothing, zilch. These guys are the, officially the second team in Rainbow Six Siege history to pull out with a 2-0 completely flawless first two games over the course of an event group stage. The first one was uh, SSG at a dream hack over some BYOC team that doesn't matter anymore. So FaZe Clan, getting themselves in the history books with their initial performance, didn't lose a single goddamn round. Rogue got two overtime victories. Chiefs took them to overtime, which I genuinely thought they were about to win that matchup. Uh, and then OXG is OXG, and we kind of already know their situation. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Daddy FaZe clapped up this group, and it wasn't right? close. I was watching OXG game, and, like, that one we didn't really have expectations for, so it was whatever. But then they played against Chiefs, and it looked identical. Like, you would have thought the Chiefs were playing with their coach as well, because FaZe Clan ran over that group. And as you as you mentioned, the second time ever that a team has started a LAN tournament, 7-0-7-0. Uh, Mini golf got a shout out to those boys. That, that was a dream <laughs> hack, right? They were yeah. a CSGO team, but not enough Rainbow Six teams showed up to that event. So they entered it as a meme, got 14 0 by SSG, and then didn't show up to their second game because they had to play in the CSGO tournament. So <laughs> realistically, this is the first time a team has like done it against real competition. The first time it actually matters. Like the first time it happened yes. at a major, uh, which I think was confirmed True. by Spencer earlier. So yeah, still a, a crazy accomplishment for FaZe Clan. Uh, when we did that Siege GG pre-show earlier, you were saying mm -hmm. that you were pretty sure FaZe Clan wasn't going to make it out of this group. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember that, actually. I don't think, but, I don't, but, but, hmm. I'm giving you credit where, where it's due because obviously we did that show before the news about Oxygen came out and then uh -huh. to send this entire group kind of spiraling out of control. So are you sold on 
phase after yes. a 14 one today, or do you still need more proof that no, they're going to get no. out? Phase, listen, listen, regardless of what multiple people, myself perhaps included, may have thought about phase, positive or negative, doesn't really matter at this point. <laughs> regardless of all of that, um, I think now it's quite clear phase clan are the only good looking team in this group. Uh, Rogue, Chiefs, and Oxygens all, I think, had very rough games today. And FaZe Clan, I mean, yeah, it doesn't get more dominant than 14-0 uh, in two best of ones. So FaZe Clan should be a pretty much guaranteed lock for uh, for first play or for uh, top eight. And because of that, that basically means they're a lock for SI. If they get top eight, I believe they lock it down. So still not 100%, but they are very, very close to confirming uh, the biggest tournament of the year. And of course, the playoffs as well. Which is interesting because in order to do that, they would probably vault themselves over a TSM if they qualified. And TSM is kind of like fighting for dear life right now with the 725 points that they earned through the regular season to qualify for SI without having to go through the qualifiers themselves. So it's kind of a big mm -hmm. deal if FaZe is able to do this. So if you are a TSM fan, uh, which by the way, if you have any NA Hopium left, please throw it out the window because it's all <laughs> bad and you bought it from the wrong dealer. This is mm -hmm. where you should be definitely worried because yeah, like you mentioned, if Ace Clan get the quarters, they're, yeah. they're going. If they make it to semis, then they're going to knock a whole bunch of teams out of contention that are that are still there like Cyclops or Sandbox mm -hmm. or Damn One who are kind of fighting with the last little scraps of points that they have. So big deal for FaZe Clan. I was impressed by this, even though the teams that they played were arguably probably two of the weaker ones. You know, it's sure. OXG yeah. who, is, who is the handicap uh, one sacrificial lamb next to IG, obviously because of the problems that they've got. Uh, and then Chiefs, which I looked at and thought there was a decent chance Chiefs could at least beat Rogue, but <laughs> FaZe are kind of on a different plane of existence in this group, at least for the first day. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I am happy for Rogue though, for what it's worth. At least managing to scrape away with two wins where I didn't think that they would. Uh, hmm. The game that they had against Chiefs is something that we'll obviously get into a little bit later. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I thought Chiefs were about to get a dub. They were really, really close. Um, but obviously, yeah, they got run rough shot over phase, so everything kind of speaks for itself here. Yeah, that Chiefs phase game as well. I was sitting in my my watch party, and I was like, guys, should I go Chiefs? I'm kind of feeling Chiefs. And I was like, I looked at it for probably 10 minutes, like, nah, I'll just pick the safe bet. <laughs> so uh, my predictions this this tournament have not, not been off to a great start, Jacob. Yeah, most of mine, I think, have been okay, but uh, uh -huh. I, 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 I genuinely thought you were trolling when you said you didn't think FaZe was going to get out of this group. That's just... I don't, I, I don't remember saying that. That's on you, brother. All right, we'll go to Group B real quick because we do have uh, some other stuff that we want to get through over the course of today. So Group B was pretty damn interesting, if only because... If we want to pull it up, if, mm -hmm. if Preston's not asleep with the wheel... There we go. Hey, by the way, uh, can we? Can everyone please type a, a TY Tango in chat? Our good friend Tango Mango Downs offered to help us out with a whole bunch of shows this week, with the exception of tomorrow, which is where our good friend Crater is going to come in. Just a TY Tango, just a thank you for the stuff that he is doing for us through the course of this week. This man is a champion, got this entire thing rigged up uh, on a moment's notice, trial by fire. Appreciate him very much for the work that he's and putting in this week. Shout out Ferme for instead of saying TY Tango goes for the Lemicky Tango. Also acceptable. <laughs> oh, good. That'll work out too. Candor designed the graphics, created put the package together. Tango's the one running it, and the two of us are here, and we will have guests later on as this week goes. So keep your eyes peeled for those announcements. All right, Group B, I liked this one because mm -hmm. I, I figured... Dark Zero wasn't going to do anything substantial. Obviously, that 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 came to pass. Vitality gave them a pretty hard ass kicking with their first game of the day, as we'll touch on in a second. And Team One and Sandbox, the two teams that I thought were going to get out of this group in the first place, because I don't think Sandbox is a hot take, currently topping the leaderboards. What do you think? Yeah, I, I wasn't a huge believer in Sandbox before this uh, before this first play day, but I think they look pretty solid. Obviously, tied with Vitality right now. My my. My hope was Dark Zero could come into this and, like, have significantly improved since Stage 3. I, we talked about this on the CGG podcast, right? Yeah. That didn't happen. Dark Zero came out, and uh, they looked awful. So, between Sandbox and Vitality, for me, it really is going to come down. Obviously, they're tied in points. It's going to come down to if Vitality can get a lot more Bibu clutches in there. Um, he had some really important rounds. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. I think, like, the big takeaway for... Uh, for sandbox is they had a slightly harder schedule today than yeah um than vitality because sandbox actually had to play against team one didn't go great um whereas vitality had to just play against dark zero and then they played against each other so if you count dark zero kind of out of this group which probably is a little too early but uh if you say that they're one of the weaker teams compared to team one 
then uh, it looks quite good for uh, for Korea's old faithful boys in Sandbox Gaming to come out and get top two. I was very happy that uh, when, even though Cloud9 ended up dropping this team and then they went back to Mantis FPS, when they did, when they were in APAC North and they ended up winning the whole thing, I was really happy that they didn't allow what was a really bad stage two slump and then getting dropped by an org that's had them for what, like a year and a half, two years or something like mm -hmm. that to get them down. And they're back here with a new org that's also Korea based, which apparently for them is also like a big relief to have something that's a little bit closer to home. Cloud9 is a powerhouse, but Sandbox like is 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 a homegrown to them, which is nice uh, for connections. Yeah. Um, and now they're here, uh, their round differential is is only nine and ten which is is really damn solid given we didn't know what vitality was going to do in this major uh and we also kind of expected team one to run away with most of this group just kind of given how it was laid out so uh -huh. i'm happy sandbox are in it even though they do only retain a tiebreaker right now over vitality because of the because like the, they won their match from they earlier yeah Th that's like the, the fact that they're still in second place at least for right now gives me hope that we'll actually be able to qualify so yeah, and that 9 and 10 round differential, keep in mind, that's a 7-2 loss over Team 1 included in there. Yeah. So their second game over Vitality, 7-3, quite dominant scoreline. So, yeah, I think they're looking very good right now. And obviously, you know, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but Team 1 are absolutely crushing this group. That yep. was kind of predicted from, from the get-go. Yeah, there was no way Team 1 wasn't going to get out. You kind of can't root against the... Uh... The reigning major champions though then again a lot of people kind of made that mistake and thought nip was going to get out of their group in mexico and that didn't happen so true uh, team one or no nip when it comes to the mentality in agreed my they can actually handle <laughs> recoil let's talk about group c as we head into their group believe it or not which also happens to include bds invictus and sonics now this was a case where we knew invictus probably wasn't going to do anything substantial which is why mm it was easy to assume that everyone would be farming points off of them. Like when you played Invictus, you were gonna, you were gonna get some points, which is gonna make the race to for those top two spots even closer, uh, even closer than Group B was at, at Mexico, because that was only three teams and didn't in inc include the fourth because Knights couldn't make it. This is where mm. you will literally have more points. The race will be tighter. You need every single point that you can get. Uh, but I also didn't expect Sonics to shit the bed this bad. <laughs> Yeah, that was tough for me. Um, like, if they had just gotten two losses, they played BDS and NIP, so they haven't played, sorry, they haven't played uh, Invictus yet, which you'd anticipate to be sort of Sonic's free win, if we can call it that way. It's probably not that free. Uh, NIP certainly struggled in that matchup, but you expect Sonics to win that one. Sonics did have a hard schedule today, but they only got two rounds in each game, right? Four and 14 on your round count. Even though they're against some good teams, you've got to be doing better than that. And like, if Sonics are losing to these teams, like these are the teams you have to beat to get out. You gotta beat one of them, either BDS or NIP. Uh, they're currently sitting at the top here. Group C for me feels a lot like Group B, where it's like there's one team that you really expect to, to show up and be kind of the dominant leader, that being BDS in this case. And they certainly showed it, 7-2 over Sonic, 7-3 over Invictus. Um, they're kind of right where they expect it to be. And then it was supposed to be the battle between Sonics and NIP. And it still could be, right? If Sonics can pick it up in the next couple of games, NIP still have to play against BDS, which should be a loss. They have to play against them twice. Yeah. There should be a couple of losses. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as that first encounter goes, 7 to NIP on bank. Not what you wanted if you're, if you're SQ. Man. This is just hard to see Sonics down here. Obviously, the story is going to be BDS. We knew was going to make it out, and it's more like, is NIP going to show up today? And they did. But the yeah. the one of the chaos theory ideas that I had on that CGG podcast was the idea that, let's just say, Invictus actually make it out of this group. What that would imply them doing is also making it out of this group over NIP, which would be the second major that NIP is eliminated in the group stage for. But From an APAC team. For, from an APAC team, which would be even funnier. But here's the thing. This is the group already through the first day where there is the biggest points discrepancy between top two and bottom two. Everyone else is a little mm -hmm. bit closer. There might be a team at the bottom in fourth place that has like no points or one point that and nobody really assumes will probably make it out. But here we have two teams that got six points and two teams that didn't get shit, which means there's way more of a divide. And as we go into tomorrow and the next day, that's actually going to matter pretty significantly. For every other team that might've had like three or four or five points somewhere in that range, 
they're a lot closer to one another because they had overtime results and it meant more teams got points if games were forced to OT. Didn't happen here, which means when we hit these last two days, it's going to matter a lot more. The fact that BDS and NIP pulled out to this early lead. Technically, the possibility, I believe, does exist that tomorrow both BDS and NIP could qualify to the playoffs just because of how well this day went, assuming tomorrow mm -hmm. goes as well as today went for them. Yeah, hundred percent. There's uh, there's a possibility that day three just straight up doesn't matter for Group E and uh, or sorry for Group C. Yeah, and uh, that's the danger of this format, right? If you get uh, if you really like screw up in that second or that first day, you've got to do or die days two and three. A third of your points already in the garbage can for Sonics and Invictus, and yeah, this round uh, this this group might just be the most boring group because we already know the team's getting out of it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Day two still has potentially surprises in store. True, true, true. All right, let's hit the group D real fast, and then we'll jump into individual games. Group D, the perpetual group of death. D stands for death. I don't know why they're biased towards the letter D. <laughs> they just are anyway. And oh my god, that's Damwon 2-0 and Empire 0-2. Oh, dear Christ. We were talking all day about how NA shit the bed, but how about Empire not doing anything substantial today? Yeah, I mean, Empire, we'll get to it in a bit, but Empire versus SSG was a close game. They looked to be in control of it towards that second half, but SSG, the Clutch Kings, um, coming out on top. Tough day for Empire, for sure. That 7-3 uh, game, uh, the second match of the day there, is probably the most defining match for me of this whole group. Sort of embodies both of those storylines. Damn one Kia popping off. Empire really seemingly to struggle. Um, it was an Oregon game where Damwon got to start on defense, so you always take that as like a little bit of a boost, right, to, to start off and maybe have a bit more dominant of a scoreline. Um, but then Damwon won three attacks, so like, eh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Damwon Kia still seem very, very set. They're another team that I believe uh, are trying to lock down SI, right? They're in contention, yeah, but they're at the bottom of the list, I believe, with Cyclops as one of the two APAC teams that's still... Right. No, sorry, uh, with Cyclops and Sandbox, but Damwon are tied in 15th place with Sandbox at 665 plus currently. Right. Um, so th they're so, literally at, at about as bottom as bottom can get. So the odds for Damwon coming into this were some were like not, basically 100 if they make it out of groups and like 22 if they don't make it out of groups right now because they have a great uh, chance of making it out of groups damn on kia's odds of uh, making si are at 73 percent so Ooh. apex doing well shout out to spur bunny for those stats yeah spur bunny thank you for hooking us up with everything especially for north american league that was incredibly helpful all right so that's your standings overall. And like we mentioned before, I got B stream, Jesse got A stream. So we are going to kick off all of these individual match recaps with him. We started in APAC with a game I was really hoping was going to go the way of the Koreans, but the major <laughs> champs pulled it out. So what the hell happened? Yeah, Sandbox versus Team 1. So this was a coastline game and it really didn't feel like Sandbox had woken up in this matchup yet. Um, they just seemed so oblivious to what was going on. Uh, team 1 had four plants. In the first half on coastline which is kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. um there was there was like a kitchen defense where like sandbox were all they had the roamers all set up they had one guy service uh team one walk in they trade the guy they plant and it's like a 4v4 plan and sandbox were like totally caught off guard they're like oh yeah i guess you could do that and they <laughs> seem to have absolutely no idea what was going on five one half for team one filled with loads of planting and then when they swapped to defense it was more competitive. Sandbox did win the first game, um, but Nova was dying very often to KDS. Nova was playing on the hard breach. KDS was going for, he went for a run out, not a run out, a spawn peak once. Um, no, a C4, that's what it was. It was a C4 in round eight, and then a shot through the drone hole while he was approaching the building through the bathroom drone hole the second time to kill the hard breach twice. And just dominant uh, opening picks from KDS to make all that happen. So... Yeah, Team 1 came out, the gun, came out the gate swinging. Sandbox, you really can't say the same thing. One sort of negative to Team 1, if we can pack on this. Alamo was a little quiet. Not only was he just not finding kills, but he was losing gunfights. Mm. Something to worry about, perhaps. Um, but again, everybody else was there. KDS, probably the MVP of that matchup. And uh, yeah, they were feeling really good there. We have uh, Mav twice up on the screen. We're trying to get that corrected. Um, to, team uh... 1 banned Thatcher. Yeah, what team happened. one. Oh, team one had Thatcher or Sandbox had Thatcher. Team one had Thatcher, Sandbox had Maverick. Gotcha. So we'll get a little bit of an adjustment there. But okay, cool. So on coastline, I was a little bit worried. This just kind of 
as a as a general mostly because of how team one played on coastline back for the yeah. grand final of the major that was where i i i thought that map was going to be the thing that hinged more like decided how that major grand final was going to go overall more so the fact that we ended up playing it to start things off i looked at that and went sandbox have already kind of lost this game and that assuming the team one showed up and i had zero reason to think that they weren't going to show up in this match so good that they did uh not the greatest start in the world for the koreans because i don't know how often they ended up actually playing this themselves that would be a pretty good thing to double check because there were that, there were yeah. uh, like a couple of times where teams got caught out by having really crap bans which is the reason why empire ended up losing their first game and we'll obviously get mm -hmm. to more of that in a second but i do think that this was kind of a case where because it's not a map that sandbox have usually played to my knowledge let's do a double check real quick yeah okay 50 percent win rate to two players over the past you know three months but obviously one of those losses was the team one they'd beaten damn one on it it's usually banned against them more often than not so it's it's just it, you understand where the strength lay for team one as this and mm -hmm. this game kicked off and you're just like yep that's kind of the end of it yeah that was uh that was pretty much it for for sandbox this was it really did feel like they weren't firing on all cylinders so like i did have hope after this game that like they would be able to turn things around um, and as we see later in this uh, later in this play day, they do end up uh, turning it around a bit. Good looks from uh, from Team One overall, though. Is, is I mean, other than Alamal kind of being a little bit quiet, and it was like yeah, ma was, major major form was still very much a thing here. That was the only real thing, and it really wasn't a, a big deal. Um, yeah, they they had a great uh, record of opening picks, both on attack and defense. I kind of only talked about their defense, but on attack they did as well. They were good at finding those openings in the defense of uh, Sandbox. I mentioned that kitchen round. So yeah, uh, team one came out looking very, very strong. And uh, I think they should definitely be considered a team to uh, probably be one of the favorites to win this whole major once again. I wanted to make a case for Envy Taylor to still also being one of the best players in APAC, but uh, I don't know if this was the game in which he was really able to prove that. <laughs> no, not this one. Uh, okay i didn't know if we also had stats up for this one if we wanted to bring it up or not but i know that we're also trying to fix the trying to fix the little thatcher thing we can't ban math twice unfortunately that'd be cool if we could i mean no it really wouldn't because that wouldn't serve any goddamn purpose what am i thinking anyway well, no uh good way idea. to start off the group overall mostly because the other game in the group also uh was a blowout so like to start with i figured yeah. hey we may very well end up having like an early day but but no, it was just everyone in Group B wanted to wanted to come out firing and just get out some early aggression, or maybe some teams weren't awake totally. So that was mm -hmm. that was how we started things. Uh, we'll figure out what's going on here. Oh, all you can, do you do you want to start just like touching on the second game? We can kind of double back if we need to. I kind of can, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. so long as we get uh, as we come up with second game, so we're not completely screwing ourselves over or the the graphic doesn't line up with what we're talking about yeah sweet there we go hey okay Sick. yeah professional this one, broadcast this one sucked this game stuck <laughs> so dark zero uh -huh. on bank is something that uh to my memory what we'd seen against astralis and that was within like the last week when we were working in yep. los angeles that was the one time that we ever yep. saw dark zero play bank um and it was a map that i didn't have a lot of confidence in anyway because they did end up losing that game to astralis it was it was pretty futile and it was a case right. where i didn't want them to bring it out in a major context at all because vitality came to play they love this map considerably more than dark zero does they play it more consistently and it was a seven to one uh defensive opening picks were a super common thing that we found vitality were getting super aggro it, whether it was runouts or not they were challenging every single space of ground that dark zero were attempting to take as this match progressed so over their entire defensive half it's vigil getting aggro it's stopping some very pivotal pieces of dark zero's overall attacking puzzle in their tracks operator selection wise um if like if they lost a yana that meant their entire push was stalled out for probably like a good minute which is like too much time if you lose an entry player um if they lost the habana they were too slow to adapt to having one less hard breach because they, they they ran a double hard breach set on this map um and it was a 6-0 half that kind of like in perspective for dark zero on attack we knew it was going to be super weak for them anyway but i didn't mm -hmm. think that they were going to start out their first game of the major by not getting a single round on attack that was ultimately to me something i was more devastated by we knew attacking was going to be a problem when they came in but i didn't think it would be that bad right the other thing that was curious for me which does carry over into dark zero second game of the day was the fact that canadian was the one playing flex and he used his flexibility like to play 
everything under the sun. He was Ash twice. He was Jackal, Capitao, Finca, and Buck. He was the handyman for whatever the situation required for Dark Zero Strat. But it didn't work out. Like, if we have the ability to pull stats up, you'll see what I'm talking about. He did not have a good stat line overall. And regardless of what site they were approaching and the op that he picked, everyone else, I think, was staying pretty stalwart on what they were playing. But it, 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 none of it was working. Like, NJR was the one sticking the sledge, which he and Eclipse had kind of been sharing a lot in Stage 3 of the NAL. Um, but it mm -hmm. was something that he stuck. Eclipse was playing Hard Breach. Panbo was the one playing Habana. Uh, and overall, role-wise, what we thought Canadian was doing by just being a direct replacement for BC on like an IGL support capacity didn't really seem like it was a thing here. Right, and if you remember, that was exactly the composition they ran for the final week of the NAL. Those last three games, Canadian was on kind of like this entry flex position, Eclipse was hard breach, um, NJR was sledge. Like, they, they rocked this in the NAL, and it looked really good. Like, this fresh Dark Zero came out of the gates for the final week, and it looked solid in, uh, in NAL but clearly not working out uh, in Sweden. The other thing that like seems like it's completely being flipped on its head for Dark Zero is when they played that game against Astralis, although they lost, I liked their attacks. Like I thought their attacks were pretty decent on bank. They come out against uh, Vitality on bank and they get 6-0'd on their attacking half. I'm curious, did they bring out any of like their, their Monty plays or anything? Like that was kind of the key thing that like, was cool about some of their attacks against Astralis. Were they playing that or were they just kind of running more defaults? Not in this game. That wasn't something yeah. they tried. Uh, I know that the reason why he wanted to make that shift over to flex was mostly so that he could find a way to IGL a little bit more efficiently than he could from a support capacity, which is kind of mm -hmm. a philosophy that I get, but you also kind of have to remember back when bio was playing i think it was in the igl on beast coast for stage two and he was he wanted to do more of a flex igl thing but it yes. wasn't like statistically they would win more rounds if he was playing a support igl as opposed to a flex igl that's what i'm a little bit worried about here mostly because dark zero played bank twice today and both of them had very similar results they got three rounds in their second game but it didn't matter because they still lost and attacking prowess was not to be found in either game so no Monty brought out here. He was he was flexing around to to I mean everything that has like the word flex and then he was playing Jack while he was Finka, he was Buck. Like I, I thought NJR might be the one to play a little bit more Finka instead because he was the one who pioneered it in North America. But that was something mm -hmm. that Troy played for one round and then dropped it. Um, man advantages weren't super drastic either. It felt like uh, usually if it was a four, like if if one person got killed, then the man count got evened up pretty easily. So four fours and three threes were common. Uh, and the all, other crucial thing to note: Nomad was not banned, and yet it felt like there was almost no flank watch, like at hmm. all. Which is uh, which? Remember back when Eclipse was somebody who we touted as being one of the better flank watch players in North America? Yeah, and, like played Nomad a shit ton. Didn't do yeah. it on, on a map where roams are incredibly common and Vitality were making them pay for it. Yeah, that is odd. It does feel like Nomad is like a pretty solid operator on bank. Like you can get kind of creative with your bank uh, lineups, but like you know, flanking is certainly a thing, um, and roam game is very important on bank. So that is yeah. a bit of a shock. I don't know if I think Pamba is kind of slid into that flank watch role. I don't know if it's super. I don't know if it's as rigid as the roles were before. Um, but maybe it's just not an operator he's as comfortable with. Uh, we'll see. We'll see as things go forward. But yeah, I haven't really seen a whole lot of that from them. Yeah, I was a little disappointed by it, but it's not probably like I mean, just from from this game. I didn't think it was the end of the world. I thought it was like okay, Dark Zero on attack. We knew it was weak. Okay, Dark Zero on bank was kind of unexpected in Vitality or an EU team where bank is played way more consistently, so they have a better mm -hmm. way to prepare for it. Um, I did kind of assume initially that this was a one off, but then as the as the stream continues and as the games went on, you will you'll find out that that was uh, that was not to be. So. And we moved from one bank game into another, Jacob. This will be a common theme of our broadcast. This one was over quickly, thankfully, for those who don't enjoy watching bank. 7-0. Yeah, this one was this one was fast. This was FaZe Clan beating a crippled Oxygen Esports who just couldn't find anything. Laxing, bless his soul, gave it his all. He was playing <laughs> so well, actually. Super aggressive. I think he had like six kills by round two or something. All the right. rest of his team, I think, had one combined through everybody um by the end of it hopes did pick up a frag on their Good. final round the seventh round he got one kill um the biggest disappointment in my mind actually wasn't hopes in that game it was kino who was really struggling in a lot of his uh engagements like on the roam or back on site playing as smoke he really did have some struggles there um and uh yeah he finished the game with zero kills wasn't loving uh the way that he was playing uh just seems i don't know off i guess 
they they were running a lot of these like drone denial roams, which I love, right? Drone denial on on bank. I think it's the best way to play the majority of sites, but I don't think FaZe got the message. Like FaZe still had perfect drones. The intel was amazing. There was like a 60 second clip where like Hopes is just in open area and he's like peeking like the like the um like the printer like window thing, the copy yeah. window or whatever it is. And he's on a drone the whole time. And he's on vigil and he's like turning it off and turning it back on. It's like they know you're there, dude. Just turn <laughs> around and shoot the drone. Uh it's getting kind of cringe. So that was you know, it was, it was a fast game. Uh, not a whole lot to say about it other than just the, the Rome game of, uh, of auction esports totally getting torn apart and hopes and, and Kino really slowing down. So obviously Yaga and Kino having to play games from their hotel rooms wasn't ideal. If you looked at the mainstream uh -huh. and wondered why the two of them or like why there were only three members of OXG who are playing next to one another, it's because that's kind of just the setup that they've got. And obviously two players can't join them because of COVID protocol for right now. But uh, on Kino and Yaga's side, was there any, what was, the, I, I figured both of them would be handicapped based upon their playing mm -hmm. conditions. Was that the case for both of them? I think the stats will probably prove if it was or wasn't, but I didn't know if they would end up having like any impact at all or just kind of how that would turn yeah. out for them yeah i mean kino definitely didn't have any impact his cost uh 29 i don't even know where that's coming from um <laughs> probably got traded a couple times by laxing and y y yeah you can see the stat there 1.28 rating from laxing and nobody else was there um yaga i didn't feel had much uh much impact as at all really vertical was a player that like started doing well maybe in that second quarter to like the third quarter area okay. um later in the game he definitely started to pop off a little bit more but he was really getting focused and shut down it felt like by phase clan especially through his first couple of rounds being eaten by nades being dedicatedly hunted on the roam game vertical seemed to uh, always be the target of phase clan's aggression so yeah he he did, he did all right i guess given the circumstances but um, no, other than laxing, and laxing had to pull some, again, theatrics to get a scoreline like that. I'm talking jumping out of windows, <laughs> going for the dumbest swings you've ever seen. Um, but I mean, hey, he was gunning, so it's something. I am curious about what OXG's mental game is going into an event like this. Other than it being like crushed, I wonder if it's mm -hmm. a case where they're interested in just kind of throwing something at the wall and seeing if it stick probably like their expectations for themselves are they down are they not really thinking that they're going to qualify like are they are they literally just going mm -hmm. you know what let's see if we can have some fun with this because even in moments where they were down bad in some matchups even if they lost a round and cameras cut back to them they're still finding a reason to joke around or the the three guys that we can see yeah. I, I felt like it was a lot of hopes and laxing just joking around there they were being jovial all the like in some cases it wasn't like they were just completely mm -hmm. dead all the time which was kind of cool to see but if they're just kind of doing dumb shit and hoping dumb shit works that for me is more entertaining just because i don't sure. want to watch a corpse play rainbow six i'd rather <laughs> play or see like more qualified complete teams end up doing it but uh yeah yeah because they already know they're going to the invitational so to them exactly. if they can't play with their full five does this really matter for them anymore yeah, I don't know. I'm sure like the vibes were were not super super serious. Maybe for Kino and Yaga, they were a little bit more downtrodden because they can't even like enjoy the games like with their teammates right True, next to them. Yeah. You know. But yeah, I feel Auction are probably in high spirits. I know Fox got a big ego boost because I called him uh, more important than Merc on Twitter. So like, <laughs> I'm sure they're all feeling okay. You know, they know that this is not going to be their major and it's kind of out of their hands. And you know, they'll be back for uh, they'll be back for SI. Well, we did have a very unfortunate trend of bank games. I got three of them in a row on the B stream, and I simply wanted to jump off the roof, but I didn't <laughs> because post-show matters more than dying. So we went to Rogue Chiefs, which genuinely I thought Chiefs were going to win. I, they were they were this close. They had a, a decent round advantage at the start. Uh, Rogue ended up clawing some things back because Rogue, I think, being a slow start team is kind of a trademark for them in some cases, and it was a, a common thread as the day went on. I think they were down 2-0 and had to find a way back into the matchup over overall uh chiefs would act on whatever intel they got within the first like minute and 15 seconds minute and 20 seconds or so so they began on attack and droning was very very good but even if they didn't have a perfect site setup or a way that they wanted to take and execute they were hardcore focusing on the roamers they would prioritize getting about two kills on the roam clear at the very least and usually on their attacks they got it they were dismantling it they were taking it apart and because bank got that rework recently where um there's a little bit less skylight pressure from the one above square and the one above main stairs the cool part about it now is all of the roamers have a little bit more space with which to operate so it relies more on your drone work and 
Chiefs were doing it really, really well. They'd get two kills, and if they got those two kills, they were in the driver's seat for the rest of the round. The like whatever objective they went for, if it was a plant, if it was just killing everyone else that they found, they usually found it because uh, their attack half went swimmingly because of the way that they were roam clearing. Um, there's one round that I will bring up uh, on a replay probably after this where Fisho guy just goes absolutely fucking mental on round five where he shouldn't have won this thing. Chiefs were kind of down bad because this was an example of their roam clear not going well. Um, but he pulls out some in, some nutty shots on a server defense, so we'll see if we can't show that in a second here. Um, and the, uh, the other part about it was there was a lot of really dumb repel angles on skylights like there's one on the main exterior repel above front mm -hmm. door and you kill somebody from elevator so just imagine where that is you're above front like uh, main lobby above atms uh -huh. you're repelled there and you're you're up really high upside down repel and you get an elevator kill like that that's wow. the kind of shit that's not supposed to happen somebody repelled central skylight <laughs> looking into admin office to pressure somebody and get them out of top floor on ceo like that's how nut that's how nuts chiefs were trying to play this overall Right. Did you feel, Jacob, that this was like two really good teams kind of like going at it and like playing a really intense high level game of Siege? Or was this kind of like throw central where like two teams that really are going to have a rough time for the rest of this major when they play FaZe or whoever they play if they make it to the bracket stage are, you know, kind of struggle busting the whole way through? Not this one I felt was more evenly matched than anticipated. I did think right. that Chiefs would get out of this group because I didn't think that Rogue were going to do any. Like they might have had a better performance here, but I didn't think they'd make it out of their group. But th this was a really, really good game, with the exception of one round where uh, what was it? Ethan gets two straight cap can kills in a row on two people trying to enter into open area, <laughs> and then Maestro with the AA12 long arms a shot all the way down into the middle of office and manages to stop a diffuser before it goes down there were some moments that i thought were a little bit trolly or like very uh -huh. unlikely to have succeeded but this game did feel like a matchup of two equals jacob i don't know if you found this on b stream but did you find capcan was getting like a ton of play dude he totally was are you Captain kidding me a lot yeah he has know, weird. he wasn't playing well he's round, gonna put but, himself uh, down just to the bottom and so everything is still they're playing on bad. on server they've already gone through a two minute roam clear but it hasn't really worked out so well because like i mentioned they didn't get either of those kills so leon is going to stall for as long as he can and he'll at the very least take one guy down but then watch what happens and watch how much time rogue continues to waste especially on the util burn so they have to clear aces out first and we're specifically paying attention to fisho guys so aces gets one He'll come and swing in, and then he has to do a whole bunch of things by himself. He has to open the wall back up. He doesn't have Diffuser with him. or sorry, he does, but it's not really a place where he can plant it quite yet. So the shots that he gets once he opens up these two walls, just wait for it. One smoke in. So then the red rotate becomes more apparent. Ooh. One. Okay. Two. The fadeaway right there. Jeez. That kind of shit's not supposed to work. <laughs> That's really nice. That's really nice. So yeah, this was an example of what Chiefs were capable of doing when their room clear wasn't as effective within the first like minute and a half or so. And this was a, a pretty a, a pretty good recurring theme. So if they got those those two kills, they usually went like won the round because Rogue had to bring everyone back to site. They were too consolidated, and Chiefs just kind of picked them off one by one. It's, uh, it, it's good to see Chiefs, like, having a competitive game. The game I watched from Chiefs was not that good. You can see on the side there was a 7-0. Um, <laughs> but, like, it, it's good to see some of this, like, aggression and some of this, like, some of these uh, some of these plays, like, actually paying off for them. Because they really did walk into this game thinking that Chiefs, not this game, but, like, this tournament, thinking that Chiefs would be, like, a top force uh, for APAC and, like, one of their better uh, teams. Yeah. And uh, they didn't quite win a game today, but I still have a lot of faith that, like, they can make this group interesting and 100% challenge Rogue for that second spot after phase. Yeah, I agree. And I'm going to keep on the APAC hope train for their sake. Uh, and also, yeah. if you were in B-Stream chat, the uh, like every single OS caster was in there being completely unbiased. <laughs> and it was actually like, funny as hell, like watching them like, cheer, cheer them on and be like, yep, these are our boys. They were spamming copy pastas, everything. They were That's super, great. super hyped. I honestly think Rogue probably should have ended up losing this game. I thought Chiefs were 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 a, like literally one round away from getting it done, but they just couldn't close it in the end. I really liked um, Guz's Twitter coverage. Uh, if you yeah it. He yeah, was, like doing a bunch of like uh, Twitter like analysis and a big thread. Um, that's at Guzcast if you're interested. He's uh, he's one of the Apex Southcasters, Australian lad. 
uh, and, uh, and yeah, he, he did a great job um, covering specifically the Chiefs games before he went to bed. Yeah, and I think he's only doing the Chiefs games. Like, yes, it's just I, the Chiefs games. <laughs> he's not going to do any other APAC coverage. He'll just live tweet for Chiefs stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have another right, bank well, game, or was it me? That no, had I got game? to escape. I didn't have bank for like the rest of the day almost. Uh, I had one bank game after that, so lol. <laughs> uh, I got Clubhouse instead, and BDS Sonics was a game I was really excited for, and the scoreline is a 7-2. I want to say, you know, I thought Sonics played a bit better than that. Not like a 7-5. This wasn't like ridiculously close, but I think this, this felt more like a 7-3, 7-4, right? Okay. Um, I felt like on the first half, we got a 4-2 split for um, BDS and their defenses on Clubhouse, which is like kind of expected, right? To an extent, like BDS were going for somewhat one-dimensional pushes and something fresh brought up at the analyst desk that I thought was a great point uh, after the game. Their pushes were pretty one-dimensional, either always going through Jacuzzi for a gym take or like very last minute kind of paying attention to like Garage if they were attacking on a CCV cash. Um, and BDS positioning, especially in the Rome, was just so good. They were really, really good. Like on the, uh, if they were roaming maybe on a church defense, right? They would get caught up by a drone, and then they would just like push into this like really aggressive but unexpected angle, and it would catch somebody on Sonics off guard. It was, uh, it was kind of like a great start. I thought BDS played it absolutely fantastically. Um, this wasn't a game for Shiko. This was not the Shiko show by interest of imagination. In fact, Super killed Shiko three times huh? before Shiko killed him back. I think Shiko had one kill. And Super had three. Is the fucking world ending? And all of Super's skills were on Shaiko. It, it was kind of ridiculous. Um, but Super was shutting down Shaiko hard. And that is like a legitimate sentence of like what I'm saying. Shaiko was trying to roam, but Super just like beat him out. We'll see the stats here now. Super finished with four kills. I believe three of those were on Shaiko. Wow. So he really... Shaiko bounced back in the end. And when we got to that second half, when BDS switched to attack, it was a lot better for BDS. It was a lot more dominant, I would say. Um, their roam clear was like just perfect and uh, I would say Sonics were like a little bit over committing to like the to their offsite positions um, Their gym holds like Grixer They were in like a 4v4 and Grixer was like in cash and he like sprinted out and jumped out into rafters Like for no reason. I think they were even a man up I think Sonics were in like a 5v4 and like they were just making really bad plays by the end of it but as far as like the start goes, you know, I, I did think it was pretty competitive on Sonic's attacks. Um, Kanzen was definitely like the best looking player for Sonic's. Like he definitely deserves that highest rating on the team. Um, had some had some great moments. I believe had like a one v one really early on that he unfortunately lost, but like very nearly won. Played it so well. Had a couple moments as well on the defense where like he he looked like he could clutch it out and bring it back for Sonic's, but unfortunately. Uh, just wasn't enough because you know you're playing against BDS and Alems, Chico, Breda. These players are ridiculous, and uh, yeah. So it's an NAL team on a map that usually, like, it, it, it can work out for them. I think they what they won it once in stage three, or they came close to winning it. I'm trying to remember. Well, they they dominated it stage one. They ru they ran it stage, stage one, one for sure. Yeah. Stage two, everybody perma banded against them. Stage three, I believe they played it twice and went one and one as their record. Okay, so it's one that we know they're comfortable with, like especially given like, right. their play frequency in Stage 1. We know that they like it, but were they running things similar to what they were doing in the NAL? Because it felt like their NAL play style got found out pretty quick on this map, and it was a big reason for why TSM was able to beat them back when they switched Chala over to primary IGL. What were they doing that was different from the NAL? I don't know. I think there were a couple of cool things. Like, I really did like their cash. I, I called their cash uh, take kind of um, kind of one-dimensional, but I kind of liked it. Like, they really weren't clearing Garage. They were basically, like, opening up the platform wall. And then last second, like, um, Rexon just walked in on Ace and just, like, popped the guys that were now fully focused on the breach. Like, it was kind of cool the way they were taking that. Um, on defense, they were playing, like, a lot of Mira, right? They really liked that strat. She was left unbanned, uh, of course. So they really tried to rock that, use the best of their ability. Um, but yeah, broadly, like I wouldn't say there was anything crazy. Um, they were rocking the Nook a couple of times. And I actually, I had a conversation with Joe Bro, probably two, three, four months ago, right? And he, he was trying to hype up Nook to me. He was like, listen to me, Jesse, on, on land, sound is broken, doesn't work. So barbed wire <laughs> is garbage. So team's gonna have to start relying entirely on these bulletproof cameras. And when they do, we're gonna bring nook and we're gonna just like run through them it's gonna be great and grixer was rocking the nook and bds had no barbed wire 
I think two or three bulletproof cameras. I was like, holy shit, this is exactly what Jobo described. And then Grixer lost his first opening engagement to just like a swing by like a vigil or something. It, it was Man. total garbage. Uh, and I don't think they ran it again. But like there were some ideas in there, you know, and uh, under diff different circumstances against worse teams, perhaps they would have worked. So you're saying uh, Spooky Bitch got killed by Spooky Guy or by a uh, Korean Batman? Yes. Yes, exactly. <sighs> Fucking great. Well, at least Joe Bro's innovation is something that can can be spoken for. But unfortunately, and Joe Bro wasn't even wearing a suit today. He had like a really nice dress shirt on, but there was no suit, yeah. no tie. I don't know if he's saving it for the later days. If he just doesn't own that many suits, that's fair. But like, that's his thing. Come on, dude. I mean, we have to consider how many suits we take to events because we we guaranteed yes. we know that we're there for a certain period of time. Sonics have to, you know, keep on fighting to keep on getting to additional days. So if <laughs> if you've got suits, Joe, break them out sooner rather than later so we're actually able to to bask in how dapper you are. Especially after that day one performance. Yikes. Yikes. It's very true. All right. So this was the last bank game that I had in a row. I started with three of them, and I, I just didn't want to be here anymore. This was IG against NIP. So obviously, IG are not playing with their full starting five. Hysterix is not here. Gig is playing in his stead as a coach. But I want to get something out of the way real quick before we jump into this. Gig is not washed. Gig is not a pushover. Gig plays Agreed. this game, understands how it works. And if you went into IG's matches today thinking that Gig was going to not contribute to his team, please get your head checked because the man was actually contributing. And there was a good chance that IG could have beaten NIP today. There was a very solid opportunity for that. It was a 5-1 half. It was 5-1, uh, I think, almost both ways. And then as soon as we went into defense for IG, everything just kind of fell apart because this is NIP's playground. This was a map that LATAM really, really, really liked back when it was still in competitive before I got taken out after SI 2020 was done. And NIP, if you'll remember, tried to beat Space Station on this map, and it didn't quite work out. But they had way more success overall at the Sixth Invitational um, before they got to the Grand Finals. So I knew NIP on bank was probably going to be a mistake. Uh, and it turns out that it was. But Speakeasy, 13 and 2 on Finca over a 5 1 half for Invictus. You called them he's like the best player in APAC. He was proving that, and his overall stat line to finish was 18 and 8. <laughs> Look at this boy go. He's crazy. Yep. He's crazy. I think for for Gig's part, if you're looking at his stat line, a 0.72, 6 and 9, it's true. But he was Sledge on attack, and he was playing a multitude of different roamers on defense. He was Legion, Jaeger, Malusi, Wamai. He was kind of fitting in wherever he needed to on defense. And that was where I had the question, is Gig going to kind of be like a one-for-one -one replacement overall for Hysterics? As somebody who played kind of a flex flag, uh, uh, sorry, flex frag position, he wasn't playing entry, even though he was one of the most pivotal players for IG back when they played in Mexico. But this was an easier case because Gig, not only was he getting kills, I think he, uh, over the course of his first like three or four rounds, had three kills. So he was holding his own more so than Hopes was. And I wasn't yeah. really concerned that uh, that things weren't really working out. Obviously, when there were a couple of rounds where he died first um, on both attack and defense, but everyone on IG seemed like they were capable of working without the utility that he brought, especially on attack where Speakeasy was capable of just holding down Mouse 1 with Finca LMG and winning a round because of it, because that happened like twice, I'm pretty sure, when, when, when Gig died first. Um, and all of IG's attacks focused solely on Roamer isolation. They didn't worry about putting like too many members close to a bomb site when they were working on their attacks. What they were doing was locating one guy and going, okay, we are swarming this motherfucker, we are killing him, and then we are moving on and doing the same thing over and over and over again. It was very concentrated, and it worked over and over again because and, uh, Speakeasy was the one getting most mm -hmm. of the credit, but it still felt like it was working out pretty well for IG. Then it flipped on its head, we went to defense. Bank is hella attacker sided at this major so far, so it's no surprise if he ended up winning. Yeah, I mean, what's kind of interesting with this game is you got to watch uh, IG on Bank, and I got to watch IG on Bank on their later game. They played Bank twice today. So did you think that, like, you know, I can try to compare these two games. From their operator lineups, it looked like their attacks probably went about the same, and from what you just, just described, it sounds about the same. Yeah. Do you know, like, were they trying to roam, and if they were, like, were they trying to rock, like, with a bunch of drone denial, or do you find it was more like them trying to take fights? on those defenses or were they more trying to like stall out do you know like what style of defense they were playing 
so this was a uh it was a little bit roam heavy but only in the sense mm -hmm. that they were trying to put somebody off site where they could and just stall for time as opposed to bringing somebody who was like dedicated right. intel denial they were like you could have put a mute with an mp5k in a roam spot after he put his jammers down and he wouldn't have had the jammers be necessarily anywhere close to a roam it just would have been like we'll put these on site to stop somebody from getting an exothermic on it and then we'll move away um mm -hmm. as the game went on it kind of felt like nip were losing or had the potential to lose way more of their attack rounds to the clock because of how like sometimes it was in red time where they went for their execute finally but they would win simply because their gun skill on attack was superior they didn't let the fact that pino and psycho were down bad on uh their defenses to really get in their heads which i thought was good right. good mental fortitude point from nip because I, I thought that would be their downfall in this game but they didn't let it happen IG were wasting a considerable amount of time and NIP were pulling some rounds kind of out of their asses at the very, very end. Um, gotcha. And so Psycho ended up going 16 and nine after a super worrying defensive side. And he uh, he was 14 and three on his attack. So he was kind of the counter to speak easy overall from an individual player's perspective. So, okay. Yeah. Well, following that, Jacob, I got a 15 round slobber knocker between Space Station Gamings and Furia. Eight seven and Oof. this one this was so back and forth, right? Uh there was one round, like SSG started on the defense. Um, it was on cafe, and SSG on cafe is very, very good. They dominate this map back in North America. So we were expecting big things. Um, and they popped off like at the very beginning. Uh round five, we got false, false having a maestro ace playing inside a bakery. The couple peeked his doorway, he popped them both. There were a couple coming at him, small bakery, got those guys too really having some great swings and ssg were celebrating everything was good and then the next round fantasy is like oh yeah i can ace too and got his own ace running in his finca beautifully played by him absolutely amazing stuff um yeah we have a clip coming in which is uh happening a lot later this was in overtime when we got there because that second half hot and cold you know he was playing very very well as well um, particularly on the attack, being able to catch some of the aggressive plays that uh, that Furia were were doing. There were, there was one play where they jumped out of cocktail windows going for a, a kill, right? And he got like one or two players. No, he got one player on that on the run out. And he made it back into pillars. He was like, yeah, I did it. I did my run out. But then up in like Nubal, Cotton Cold was there. It was like, no, you don't. And he made <laughs> sure to like catch that kill. Always got the trades. I really liked that uh, that play. Here's a, here's a fun one, right? Because it's round 13. And first of all, notice where SSG planted. They didn't plant default. They didn't plant near the bar. They planted that corner just to the right of rare. And so what this means, great plant spot by Skies, means that Faults has the cover from up above here. And this is when Fury was running away with it. They started to pick up some good rounds sort of towards the end. We were very, very cautious that SSG wasn't going to be able to bounce back. But what they do is they have the coverage from up above. And Faults, of course, this is almost an unlosable situation. Miracle has a good idea. He's like, wait, no, I can do this a different way. He goes back behind and goes for the disable, misses his key, reinforces at the start, but then through the wall, unfortunately, Fault is just better. Thought it was a cool strat, right? Because we hadn't seen that before. Yeah. From uh, from SSG in that game, cool plant spot, um, but ultimately uh, it wasn't able to be stopped by Furia. The big thing I think in this game that I haven't talked about is fantasy going crazy. I don't know if we've got the okay. stats, yeah. but that guy must have dropped like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 kills, right? Like, that's what it <laughs> felt like at least. He hit every shot. He clutched so hard. I mentioned his ace. He had a 3k the round right after the ace. He had a 4k in round 10. He had some incredible moments. 17 and 17. 11. That's so many kills, right? Uh, so incredible stuff from him. Um, it really felt like, you know, Fancy's a player that I think sometimes has always had good gun skill, but has at times been a little over aggressive. Yeah. His aggression was working all the time, right? He was always hitting his shots. He was always in the right position. And uh, he was the reason why Furia beat SSG today. I knew Fantasy was going to be a big deal because his stage three was the thing that was kind of pulling Furia through a lot of games. He had like yeah. 4Ks and Aces galore through stage three of BR6. And now we're here. I'm happy that he's living up to the hype, especially when it delivered in a Furia victory. That gives me like more confidence that my confidence in him was placed well. So I'm mm -hmm. happy that 17 happened. He didn't break, uh, I mean, Speakeasy had 18, so we're going to figure out if anyone had a, a more kills than, in one map overall than Speakeasy did in that game against NIP. But 17 is still really damn good. Here's yeah. the question, though. We looked at Space Station in Mexico, and we thought their group stage was relatively, like, okay, probably a little bit shaky, but it wasn't mm -hmm. exactly a representation of what we knew they were doing in the NAL. Now that they've got Skies, 
and they're a little bit more, I, I, I would say probably in their groove, so to speak, are they actually performing up to the standards that we expect as a result of this game? What were you thinking? I think SSG played better this game than they ever did in Mexico. I think SSG like really were like having big moments. They were kind of just getting outgunned at a couple of moments. They were getting caught off guard for sure by uh, like Fury's aggression. And, and not even all the time, right? Like I do think they did a good job catching some of the aggression in that second half towards the end of the game around sort of 11 and 12, right? That's kind of when that was really popping off and they were starting to find their footing. Um, but yeah, I think at the start here, uh, throughout the majority of this game, SG did play pretty well. They were playing a lot of Valkyrie. Both teams were, obviously. It's Cafe and Valkyrie's on band. Right. I didn't feel like SSG were getting very aggressive off that intel. And we've seen that before in the NALs, particularly that Oregon game against Astralis. They loved getting that intel and getting aggressive, going for swings off it. Felt a little scared to do that. I don't know if that's just the, the tournament they're in or if the team they're against or the map they're on. Um, but that was one thing I noticed early on in that game that SSG weren't necessarily doing a great job of. You know, small, maybe they'll fix it going forward. But uh, yeah, I thought broadly SSG looked very good this game and uh yeah I'm, I'm still confident in them as na's one and only hope <laughs> no one else from na is going to do good aside from ssg they were the only na team i said we're going to get out of groups and into playoffs so i uh i was very happy about their result from later in the day but we will obviously get to that wow. a little bit later uh so what that does is put us into my game from group d from the group of death which is empire dom one and here's the thing we never see Empire play Oregon, ever. Right. This is an Empire perma ban. And do you remember, all, just as a trivia question, do you remember what the three maps that Dom Juan uh, consistently banned in Stage 2 and in Mexico were? Do you remember what three maps they were? Not off the top of my hand. Uh, top of my head. I could find it in a, in a no, 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 no. I assume I, you're about to tell me. I got the answer. So the usually perma ban, Cafe, Coast, and Club is what they've banned for stage three. What they have done okay. since then, or back in uh, in stage two and in Mexico, they also banned Coastline as just one straight up that they would never play. But right. Cafe Coast Club is the thing that they've banned very consistently. What that's done already is ban some maps that Empire are usually very good on, and Empire did not adapt to their ban phase overall, which meant that they got slated with Oregon, a map they never play, and they got booty slapped. But they also did get booty slap because of something that they do on this map they don't do anywhere else. They put always on Thermite as primary like uh, person with Diffuser in Shepard's roles. They put okay. probably one of the best sledges in Europe onto Shepard's roles and it didn't work. If we have stats, you'll see exactly what I mean. It was just like, it wasn't worth it. I, I didn't understand why this was a thing. Scyther was on Sledge instead of Always. I didn't I didn't feel like that was worthwhile for the trade-off. Always was on Plant Duty instead of Shepard. He went 1 in 10, where Always is usually somebody who's primary frag wow. or power next to somebody like a Joystick or a Dan in this case. Scyther, for his own credit, wasn't doing terrible in the Sledge role, but it was still a case where I, I looked at this and questioned why this was happening in the first place. Um... Yas was 14 and 6. That man was having a field day. This is a map that the Koreans have usually liked a lot, so I wasn't shocked when they decided that they wanted to take this. Uh, or Because um, for Sandbox, they've also liked or Oregon in the past too. So mm. I just didn't understand why the role change was happening. Apparently, they've if Reddit is to be believed, they've done this on Oregon before, and it, it still hasn't worked out because they just don't play this map ever. But the fact that it went to Oregon in the first place, I looked at this and went, Dom Juan's winning. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's, that's kind of insane how much of a different look of Empire this seems to be, right? Like, the role changes, the map coming out. The other thing I'm noticing here is, like, we always talk about Joystick on land, but he got five kills that game. Yeah. What was happening with him? Was he just not hitting his shots? Was he being shut down specifically? What happened? I felt like he was someone who tried to play aggressive, but he it, it was him getting shut down because this was where... Remember back where we saw Dan one play in Mexico and we were like, Rin's all over the place. He's going nuts. Yeah. It was the same mentality for what Rin was doing in some of those games, even though if, if we pull the stats back up, you'll notice Rin was not somebody who was like at the forefront of that Rome game. Right. That, that wasn't really his place. That was something where Yas kind of took more of the reins, mostly because I feel as though Yas is somebody who can keep a cooler head in circumstances like that. And if that ends mm -hmm. up being what Dom one did, I, I need to go back and do a little bit more uh, review on what their stage three overall looked sure. like. But the fact that Yas took more control over i'm i'm going to roam 
I have a little bit more utility with which I can escape based upon the operators he was playing. It felt like that's the way for Dom Juan to go. Yes, Rin's a nasty shot. Yes, when he's locked in, he's locked in. But the fact that he was taken off the roll a little bit more was was giving me more confidence that Dom Juan could win, especially given the fact that Empire just didn't seem confident on Oregon to begin with. I think uh, when it comes to Dom Juan, like, we typically say that, um, like at least in talking to my chat, the consensus seems to be that Yas is their best player, even if Rin had a pop off like tournament in Mexico. Yas seems to be more consistent. Yeah. Arguably the best player in Korea. The other argument you could potentially make for that is Envy Taylor. Yep. Who was in our next game against Vitality. And this Good was a segue. matchup. Thank you, right? I was really, I was hyped, I was hyped for that. <laughs> this was a match where we got to play cafe again. Jake, we got three banks in a row. I got three cafes in a row. Didn't total <laughs> six cafes, but still was a, still was a set. And um, yeah, Envy Taylor, particularly in the second half, really did pop off when, uh, when Sandbox were playing on defense. I'm going to talk about the second half and then the first half. All right. The second half was a lot about clutches for uh, Sandbox. Big individual plays. Envy Taylor started off the half with a big 1v2 clutch out of pure gun skill. He should never be winning uh, plays like that. I didn't clip it. That's my bad. I'll get it. There's, there's some more clips coming up, though. Um, and then I thought, like, Static had a really good clip as well, um, where they, like, were all pushing him on the bottom floor. He was in VIP. They all grouped up, and he just gunned them all and got three kills that were so impactful. Um, and then uh, Shael had the final round, the game-winning round. Huge 2K to have, uh, like downing the diffuser and having a big moment when uh when vitality were just kind of walking at him uh, and then won the 1v1 based only off of time so he had a very uh, very good positioning to find all of those frags and uh really like lock down this game for sandbox but it was everybody right everybody had their moment when they got onto that defensive half the start of this game was weird dude i don't know it felt like right off the bat because some people will be will be bringing it up cactus crashed twice in very important match in very important rounds they lost Aww. both of those rounds um and both rounds it was like over a minute and a half in and i think a kill had happened in both of the rounds the first round he was smoke with all three talks of babes on oh, a F. cooking defense second round he was a rooney not as important of an operator but still losing him sucked we ended up having like a 10 or 15 minute rehost um where they changed his pc they took it away gave him a whole new pc because they didn't want that to happen again um, and I, I do believe that those, you can't say for sure Vitality would have won those games uh, or what, would have won those two rounds, but I think him dropping at least in that first round basically sealed their fate. And that second round, it made it a lot harder as well. So it's kind of sucks. Um, Vitality, it wasn't a close enough game that that's like, you can pin the whole thing on that, but those two rounds were definitely tough. Um, Sandbox was going for a lot of like very, very samey pushes. It was kind of the same push over and over and over again. Um, and they were weird. I think we saw three cocktail defenses from uh, Vitality, and I think all three of them, they went for the cocktail take, like through the cocktail windows and going yeah. up from below rather than uh, clearing from piano. And it worked all three times, or sorry, except for the first time, which uh, Shinka won on a 1v1, but it worked very consistently. And uh, yeah, Vitality never really adapted, which was kind of a pain to see. You weren't kidding about the Envy Taylor rating. So that's- Yeah, dude, that's, <laughs> he's that, nuts. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but not, uh, I mean, from an entry point of view, I actually did want to touch on this from the other sandbox game because I wasn't able yeah. to watch either one of them. It seems like it's it's usually pretty good. Like, obviously, MB Taylor didn't win uh, the only one that he was engaged in. Nova was in two, but he's you know, a support player, so I would be shocked if he was you know tasked with like winning those engagements in the first place. That was mm -hmm. the thing that they were doing really well at SI. Or were they holding firm to usually winning their entry duels? Because these stats look good, but from their other game against Team 1, was it the same? Yeah, definitely in this uh, in this match it was good. I don't think so. I haven't looked at the stats. I'm pulling them up now uh, to their entry game, but my memory serves correctly. They actually did okay. Uh, no, no, they didn't do great. I was looking at the wrong team. Uh, okay. They did quite poor on on their entry game against Team One. Again, they looked pretty lost, like they were still asleep for the first half of that Team One game, and like that was a lot of just like Team One catching them off guard. This one they were way sharper. I think it helps that uh, that they started on attack because they can kind of get that initiative. They could find that entry for themselves rather than sort of relying on um vitality to take the initiative there yeah um but yeah no i, I thought the entry game was uh, was certainly back in this matchup against vitality and they were converting them which was the thing we said at si like great you get the entry but your like conversion rate is like 40 percent. what are you doing right yeah uh, they were actually converting this time so that was big good no the big concern was that 
you can do really good to start, which is where that interest stat came in, but then their mid and late game executes, whatever they were doing, and like the last like minute to 30 seconds of a round was the thing that was their downfall more often than not. So good. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. I'm rooting for this team to get out of groups, by the way. I know Hunter was very sold on Vitality getting out, but for me, it is all about sandbox. Get out, go to playoffs, because on, they, uh, they could be a quarterfinal spoiler for some team, especially if it's the second yeah. team that comes out of group A, because, oh my God, that would be a lot of fun if they could make it. But that's my hope. Uh, NA bias caster. I'm not working the event. I honestly don't care. The other game from that group was the second time we saw Dark Zero play. It was against Team One. It was on Bank again. Two times. Nice. Dark Zero wanted Bank. This time it was against the Latam team. This time they got more rounds. Still didn't matter. And we didn't see Monty play because it was banned by Team One outright. So the primary reason uh, I thought okay. that we would end up seeing Canadian on that flex role, if he wanted to try any shield play, it monty just wasn't available to start with so it was uh a case where hope i was hoping that dark zero might end up trying to go back to like the roles that worked usually but they played their bank the way that they play their bank because they are stalwart they never change up a strat uh especially like if they're in a high pressure situation they will do what they think mm -hmm. works and it's it just didn't work at all the difference was in defenses dark zero when they were on defense would hold certain positions for a certain amount of time um and they would relinquish a lot of map control for free without giving team one much of a fight and team one would fight dark zero for every single inch it was a very similar case to what vitality were doing when they played dark zero on this map there's so much space that you have to take this map people forget because it hasn't been in comp for a while this map is freaking huge it's it's like yeah. if you took theme park but stretched it vertically and not horizontally there is so much that you have to clear on bank and Dark Zero weren't really, I think, using Bank to its full ex to its fullest extent, but their opponents in both Vitality and Team One had a commonality, which is that both of them were. Canadian flexing around to everything on attack. I saw a lot of people in chat and on Reddit afterwards getting very frustrated about the fact that Canadian was doing this um, because right. he was trying to he was tr attempting to be flashy. He would move around from operator to operator. It was it was a repeat of what happened in their first game, but it simply wasn't working role wise because it's not, it like that direct one for one about what he was able to do. Um, if he was playing support to IGL was something a lot of people were just kind of assuming he would do, and he didn't do it here, and they lost again. Team mm -hmm. One is exactly the kind of team to punch Dark Zero's plans in the teeth, especially mid to late game. If you like, they lost one operator. Like even if it's a five v five and if there's like a minute and thirty seconds remaining, regardless of what operator was lost, Dark Zero start running through that checklist of okay, we can still do this, we can still do this, we can still do this. And by the time they do it, they've lost so much time working on like accomplishing all of those mini objectives after they've lost a player that the, recovering the round for them at that point simply isn't accomplishable. And Hyper could not get going in this game until it was too late he was non-existent in the vitality matchup and by the time he was getting kills that actually mattered in this game it came at the cost of almost his entire team being dead or they were down by too significant of a round count he finished with a 1.08 and he was eight and seven that is really really bad for somebody who we touted as being what he was stage two mvp he was so good yeah over the NAL in, in, in playing his role, but it almost felt like what everyone else was doing on bank just kind of stifled his potential. Yeah, I, I like that uh, that Team 1 were able to like read into that Monty ban, because I asked you about the last Dark Zero match, like, oh, do they play Monty? And they didn't. But like, as I mentioned, like in the NAL, that was like a big strat for them. I thought that was like a really good strat too. And so Team 1 just banned it out. Clearly, that's showing they did their research. Yep. Um, you were talking about like, you know, Redders getting upset about like Troy playing a bunch of different operators. You know, it was it was you... it was Twitch chat too. To be fair, <laughs> okay, Twitch chat as well. Sure, I just like to dunk on Reddit. Um, and to be fair, like again, I think Troy in the final week of the NAL was doing that and it was working a lot better. And I didn't see anybody complaining back then. Mm -hmm. But is this something where like you found he was like actually a significant problem for them? Like, would you move him back if you were you know BC tomorrow? I don't know. It's... Or mint. I would if only because it seems a little bit more comfortable to have him play a support role and to let somebody like Panba be the one tasked to go get kills. I do kind right. of feel like Troy tried to play the hero a little bit and it, it wasn't it wasn't finding success. 
Though I would like to think that Troy is still capable of playing up to a, a more aggressive flex, maybe even entry type position like he used to play like two or three years ago. He, it's not something that he's a stranger to playing, but probably within the current way that this team operates, it may simply not be possible. And especially with two bank games back to back, we didn't really get the chance to see what this team is like, quote unquote, fully capable of. If they played a different map, then maybe I wouldn't have the same critique. But on bank mm -hmm. specifically, I looked at it and went, this isn't good. So, yeah. Well, fair enough, Jacob. You know what else isn't good? Any team when they go against FaZe Clan. Uh, we had another 7-0. Uh, this was FaZe Clan versus Chiefs this time around. My third cafe map in a row, but thankfully this one wasn't too long. <laughs> um, yeah, again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, felt like Chiefs were playing without their uh, without their starting five because FaZe Clan, they played this absolutely perfectly. Like, they close out advantages. It doesn't matter sort of like what point of the round they're in. They're going to wait for they have that ad. And they're going to use that advantage so perfectly every single time. They do not throw those leads. Um, and yeah, like they know that uh, eventually that will come. Felt like with Chiefs, that was certainly the case. There were a couple of rounds that like Chiefs had a start, had a start on defense, right? On Cafe, that should be really good. And it looked really good, right? There's one round on Kitchen where they're, they're holding kind of extended into Bakery. And Fish is like in this like rotate between like uh, between Kitchen and Bakery. And like Faze are in Bakery. But he's kind of like just inside the rotate, right? And he's peeking around. He's delaying like over a minute. We're like, yo, Fish is like winning in this game. Phase Clan aren't getting risky. They're not trying to like make a play. You're like, okay, Phase are stalling out. This is it. And then Fish in a 5v5 just pushes through the breach. Maybe it was a 4v4. Maybe they lost some kills. But Fish just like throws his life away by walking through the hole in the breach. Gets uh. shot from the bakery door while looking the complete wrong direction. And it's like, you were the most important player on this hold. You were the single person keeping Empire outside of sight. And then Empire walked in sight and planted. And it's like, dude, what's going on here, Fish? You literally had this round in the bag. But, like, you just throw like this because you're playing too aggressive. And it's so frustrating sometimes um, to see those rounds. And FaceCon would always just wait for that. And they would see their moment and they would pounce on it every single time. The final round as well, um, round seven, when Chiefs finally moved on to attack. Phase Clan were just like, okay, well, this is pretty much in the bag. Let's all sit on site. It was kitchen defense. They're all sitting on site. They brought like a million different ways to deny plants. And Chiefs spent, I swear to God, two and a half minutes clearing the top two floors before they finally got to like opening of the floorboards and walking no. down the main stairs. And then they finally dropped Freezer Hatch and they never applied any pressure to VIP. So they just got clapped by the VIP player who just watched them drop and just like killed them as they were falling. Frustrating game. Um, Chiefs, I think, tweeted on, on Twitter that like they wanted to make it fast because they knew the Aussies were up late. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that, but uh, no, tough game for the Chiefs. This was not their finest hour. Now, if you want to represent Australia and New Zealand a little bit better, how about uh, you don't throw obvious rounds like that? Obviously, I didn't watch the game, so I don't know if I can call it throwing, but I did, I did just call it throwing, Look, so Jacob, Chiefs can sue me if it's bad. Jacob, Fish got zero kills and seven deaths. Ethan got zero kills and seven deaths. They both have a 0, 0.00 rating. They contributed literally nothing to this game. Zero cost, zero survival rate, zero times they were traded. It is extremely rare is, to get a 0, 0.00 rating. Is that the I've first time? I've seen it time? maybe once. I can't remember the exact game, but I think I've seen it once. Is that the single they both lowest? They got 0, 0.00. In his, okay, first time in history, two players have probably gotten a 0, 0.00 rating at a level like this. First time it's happened at a major. Holy shit. That is terrible. Yeah. That, that's that's awful and that really like you know what more do you need to say that is oh my that's bad we should just stop talking about them i feel bad all right chiefs let's not do that again please please i have you getting out of this group and you have to play face clan at least one more time so don't do that <laughs> I had them first. <laughs> oh my god. After oh. oxygen dropped. God, the things that I don't see I when we have it. to watch two two different streams at the same time. Jesus Christ. All right. Uh my last game before we had to cut into the um uh, the high caliber season reveal. That's what it was. I yes. forgot the name of the goddamn season. Uh OXG against Rogue. Somehow this went to overtime. Which I don't necessarily want to call it super uh, inexplainable, but I do want to kind of compare notes about how the OXG game against FaZe went. Because a lot of this, it didn't really seem like they were throwing caution to the wind, but it, it seemed like defenses turned into, hey, Laxing, hey, Vert, go get some kills. 
which is kind of what both of them were doing. Like Laxing was mm -hmm. very divorced from the rest of the team. He didn't play anywhere close to sight. That's just kind of how we expect Laxing to play, especially from a roam capacity. So he was doing normal Laxing things in this matchup. Yaga was playing Blackbeard, so that just kind of shows you how dire things oh were getting God. at this game. What uh, it was, it was not good. Um, Hopes ended up getting more kills overall. He had one game in the fr uh, one kill in the first game. He had three kills in this game, so that okay. was kind of cool to see. Um, just li little steady step by step improvements overall. Game was Hopes more than twice nice. as long. Yep. But, no, yes. I mean he, he had the chances. He was playing mostly Frost uh, because someone had to play Frost on Chalet, so they figured give Hopes the passive utility and then hope that Rogue kind of falls into it. And they did on occasion, um, especially from a distraction point of view, like when they you know look down to shoot someone else is usually there to shoot them as they go for the frost match so there was a lot of good coordination coming from oxg's side um i think mm -hmm. this was this was kino having a better game overall so the slump that he was in for the, the game against phase clan didn't really rear its ugly head here but this game kind of proved why prano should have been on this team in the first place and was a big reason for why they were getting out of their eul slump and are they going to be in relegations like wh where do we expect them to be they yank him from Gamma, they put him on this team, they give him some support capacity, and he is really, like, I think he might have top frag in this match, if we've got stats overall. He was having a mammoth match. Wow. And I think, yeah, he did. 17 and 8 as somebody who was playing mostly support roles. Like, that is pretty insane. I would like to say cry and step up a little bit, but this is still a case where Prano had a better game than anybody was anticipating, and even though this was a game that was forced to overtime, it was probably still off the back of Prano's contributions from a support capacity that enabled them to get this win in the first place. Like, Laxing and Vertical were playing their goddamn hearts out, <laughs> and it still didn't work out because of what Prano and Rips were doing. The Oxygen stat line looks like it's better, but it looks similar in, like, who's where to the first Oxygen game, where, like, Laxing is, like, far and away the best. Vertical's more in the mix this time compared to that first game, mm -hmm. um, which is good to see. But like, do you see, do you think that this is Oxygen just kind of like throwing all caution to the wind saying we're not going to play strats, we're not going to play serious, we're just going to jump out and play super duper aggro and hope we can pull off like a fanatic and, and get the upset even though we're playing with the coach or do you yeah. think this is still like relatively structured siege? <sighs> Man, this is a case where I, I I want it to be structured, or like especially to, to what they've played overall in stage three. We saw them do really really good when they had all their ducks in a row, but now mm -hmm. they understand the handicap that they're playing against, and they are very much playing against it and not with it, which is the mentality I was curious about before. Um, like when we saw the announcement how are they going to work around this as far as i'm concerned they may just be saying let's try to play this as fast as possible as aggro as possible let's do something a little bit out of the box for what we uh -huh. did in stage three which was kind of what i was assuming they were going to do to begin with because i i figured like you have to keep things fresh because the reason you did poorly in stage two was you got found out very quickly but um this kind of play i do expect to be consistent but this kind of play was not consistent with what they were doing in stage three so that's that's kind of where it differs gotcha all right well jacob um we talked about that invictus bank game earlier uh in the stream but yeah. they did it again against bds and again there were based on your description i didn't watch that first game but it sounds like there were a lot of similarities uh for ig in their initial bank game versus this bank game yeah um they started on attack they only got one round on attack BDS's roams are just ridiculously good. This trump to the Sonics sure as hell gonna trump uh, IG, and um, yeah, it was it was really really difficult for them to get anywhere uh, and get anything going. A lot of the time, it felt like IG's strategy was we're gonna pop the Finca boost, and we're gonna walk at them. That was kind of all there ever was. And you were talking about how they would sometimes use that Finca boost, kind of like swarm somebody and like isolate somebody. Yeah. BDS were playing so like as a unit and so clumped up. That they would just like you know best case scenario the thinker walks up gets a kill and then they get swung on by like nine bds players like it wasn't even uh it didn't look good at all for uh for ig when they were going for these plays right so that was pretty insane when we got to the second half it was better for invictus gaming um it did feel like their roams lacked a little bit of that uh utility dump which is something i asked you about okay or not utility i'm sorry drone denial which i asked you about earlier yeah, in the stream yeah. right where they were like they were trying to roam and they would like they wouldn't they weren't bring any intel denial um so oftentimes it was just bds very easily walking through them with no problem there was one good play and i want to have it as a highlight here because speak easy had uh, 
a bit of an unorthodox Echo clutch. It's not the typical way you expect the clutch out on Echo. Okay. He's got the yokai. He's got it in his pocket. He's ready to use it. But there's still 14 seconds. That's plenty of time for him to get the yokai off. Then it gets shot. He does fire it off one time. But then look at this gunplay. The wide swing out into the breach. The third or fourth peak. There he goes. Diffuse kit plants Jeez. it. But goddamn. <laughs> beak easy. To deny the loss, right? This was 6-2 on the scoreboard. Obviously, yeah. they lost the next round. It, it was a 6-3 game. But extended it that one more. And, uh, yeah, this is why I think Speakeasy is the best player in all of APAC. This was, like, one of those pop-off plays where it's like, oh, boy. He really just hit all of those on a, on a one speed at that, Jacob. That's crazy. I, I mean, to his credit, he did have two players, like, clump up and swing him at the, uh, like, because he yeah. doesn't have to move his crosshair very much from the doorway over to where, uh, who was it? I think it was a Lems came back and swung him back around the bomb chassis. Mm -hmm. But still, mm -hmm. I trust Speakeasy to hit those shots, like, literally every day of the week. So mad props to him for get, getting this to work. I could watch this over and over again because it's just clean. I mean, Rafal yeah. and Alems are on slightly low HP, but still, that's not bad. And I think stats-wise, he still came out. He, he had a 1.19, and like everyone else's stats just kind of like descended from that point. Um, mm -hmm. Was Gig staying consistent on what I mentioned from before, playing a lot of sledge and then kind of flexing around to whatever they needed on defense? Was it still kind of the same idea? It's the same map, so I assume it was, but... Gig was good, dude. Gig was hitting his shots. He was like playing really efficient sledge. Like he was opening up the floorboards. He was getting kills from above. His nades were really good. There were a couple of like really key moments where it's like, here's a big nest of utility. They're going to have to hit a pretty difficult nade. And Gig like bounced it off a pillar from like the floor below. He was in like lobby. He was outside of like the small office in lobby's window. Yeah. Bounced it off the pillar in like the little banana walkaway thing and like got the mute jammers off of the wall. And it's like, damn, Gig. Yeah, okay, land those nades. Yeah. Those he, nades good. Gig, Gig played well. He wasn't going to be somebody who was a slouch, uh, no. especially from an individual skill level. But the two things I was worried about was, like, comms, because I know that, like, it's not the most clear English for a lot of people, even though I do think that that, that is a language that Invictus have no problem calming in. And then, yeah. obviously, what role he ends up fitting into. Is it going to be a direct copy replacement for Hysterics? Is it going to be um, someone else moves into Hysterics' role and you just slap the coach on the support because that's, that's what makes more sense? But they didn't want to disrupt too much of what worked for them. They're still giving him flex capacity. He's capable of playing Sledge. I'm cool with it. Well done, Mr. Hindel. So keep on doing that. Let's see if you guys can make it out of groups. I would still love you to knock NIP out. That'd be funny as hell. <laughs> uh, two more games left to go. I had NIP and Sonics. Yet again, Sonics deciding to... Well, Sonics went to a map against BDS that they were super comfortable with. And I'm like, okay. This was the first time that we had seen Sonics play Bank. Right. They were going to lose from the outset. I knew in the map band that they were going to lose because who's their opponent? Ninjas of Pajamas current world champions team that i didn't think was going to lose at all they were still undefeated on bank by this point and it was a 72 that kind of already tells the story for nip having a 100 percent win rate this entire thing just looked like a massive fucking yikes they moved at their own pace this was the thing that i i, I mainly wanted to touch on was the idea that sonics didn't seem like they had any capability to hang with whatever pace nip was setting if they were roaming, it was shut down. If they were sticking around on site, it was shut down. But it's bank, which forces a little bit more of a, of a, or it dictates that if you don't roam, you're probably going to lose anyway. So they were trying that. Yeti was doing, or was following through with a lot of the motions that led to NAL success, especially like with Malusi against NAL teams. It's not something that translated to international at all, especially against a Brazilian team. I just thought that was a complete whiff at the start. Um, and I didn't really have that many uh, more notes other than that because this was a case where NIP simply killed them every single round over and over again. They got slaughtered. There's no other way to yeah. say it. Don't go to bank if you're Sonics. There was a reason you banned us over and over again. It's nice if you're capable of bringing it out in some cases, mm -hmm. but do it against teams that don't have this kind of reputation on the map like this. I mean, I came into this major and I said, like, I really want to see Sonics playing new maps, right? Because, like, they hit sure. a lot of maps throughout the last couple of stages. And in Mexico, they didn't. They played their same map pool. I didn't think that was a recipe for success. Um, but if they just can't play it, like, was there, was there like, no redeeming qualities? Do you think that, like, really just their strats on this map were fundamentally flawed? Or was it, like, you know, was there anything there? Or was it kind of just NIP slaughtering them on you know gunfights and everything i kind of felt more like it was just nip doing their thing and just 
like th you could have put any team that was of a relative skill level to sonics in this position and it would have been the same outcome e like even though right. okay. we we understand sonics can, can strat heavy they usually have some some decently deep pockets at times but there was an adaptation if something wasn't working they were trying to do the same thing over and over again and they were they were relying on their defensive performance going to carry them through not something that was going to work on a map like this like to begin with because this is an attacker sided heaven for most teams yeah. and this that was something nip were taking full advantage of pino didn't have a really good game to start earlier he came back and had a 1.5 a 1.47 for kamikaze a 1.41 for muzi they were killing it they loved it they loved bank don't take nip to bank what are you doing that's the only lesson to be learned here fair enough jacob well after that na was in shambles right we had we were lost already in shambles. seven games in a row seven matches and uh, we had one last hope and it was the space boys against empire holy shit this was a game it went 12 rounds seven five and i just want to show you two replays because this was round one and then round two we're going to yeah. start round one if we've got it pulled up here these are two rounds that empire look like they are running away with ssg is getting stomped to start off this map right so it's the first clip I posted, followed by, yeah, that yep. one. So we'll, we'll get it through. But SSG is getting absolutely destroyed throughout the majority of these rounds. Hot and Cold's gone. I don't know where Hot and Cold is throughing this game, but he's not in the server. Skies isn't doing anything. Then Fault does this. He's already gotten a kill at this point. So he's going to get a 4K if he can get this 1v3 clutch. But just watch these. Look, gets inside the building, fully pushes in because he wants this one kill to his right. Not sure which angle to go for. Reloads mid clutch. <laughs> Gets the one with the dwarf, flicks back over, and then it's the quad kill. Our observer looks up. We can see these outlines. Fault has to stare down at the ground. And you better believe he gets off at the perfect moment <laughs> to clutch up yeah. against Dan. Get back on the disable. Look at that arm in the air. Like, no way did he miss that. Ridiculous. And at that point, the mouse is out. At that point, we're thinking, <laughs> damn, that's the best. That, that's arguably like the best clutch of the day. And then one round later, one round later, I'm calling it, this is probably going to be the sickest play we see through the entire major. Uh, Rampy wow. posted on Twitter saying this was the best clutch of his career. It's a 1v5, right? We're starting a little bit late once again. But Rampy's pushing through, gets both of those kills. I wish we'd start from the start. I don't know if I clipped this incorrectly, but ridiculous how this goes on. Um, here we see, right? Now it's the 1v5. He pushes up, get the first kill. The second guy swings in in front of him. Watch his HP, right? He's one bullet away. Gets one ridiculous shot through the bathroom. Takes a bu or gets healed up by the uh, charge from the Thunderbird. Gets shot almost the next frame, right? We're going to watch it a third time because you've got to watch this health. He gets <laughs> healed up and shot one frame after the other. Stays alive all because he's playing Thunderbird and can get the fourth kill. Hides for the fifth. This was as close as uh, we've seen to an ace clutch in years jacob 1v5 four kills ridiculous let it this play is a play again. that happens once in a lifetime i was really impressed by this i would say let it play again Preston, if you want to because the thing i'm most impressed by go uh go back to the start and then like pause it like uh, right at the beginning so we have an understanding of like where rampy's position so skies is caught back he is stuck hot and mm -hmm. cold's also about to be stuck skies gets the like he gets nated here so then move forward a little bit watch as rampy comes back up astro stairs the best part about this is his swing one to two when he gets the kill on bathroom and immediately the repel comes back in zero doesn't have his position scouted or the buck i'm pretty sure and he does it perfectly that's the more impressive part is he not only has enough bullets in the bearing nine he controls the bearing nine and keeps it going for three kills without having to reload good freaking grief rampy keep on doing this look at dude skies dude face i love is the reaction right yeah it's so good it's so good they stand up like how did we do that wow like, ramp is insane and yeah switching to the secondary here bearing nine not an easy weapon to pull that off and again he took that shot walking to that position he would have died if he didn't get healed by the thunderbird literally mm -hmm. the frame before <sighs> insane so question Anyways, then question yeah then being, go ahead out of curiosity because we had two clutches to start a game like that yeah those are obviously insane neither Fultz nor rampy should have won those rounds outright based on how empire played it and they played it correctly up until they let one player win the round on them mm -hmm. 
is that something we should be like worried about at all like two rounds being one-off clutches was space station able to at least like carry through the rest of the game and not like throw things away on defense they were still able to hold their own they played villa well like how are they doing and should we be worried about the fact that they won this game because of two crazy clutches in the, like to start with right so ssg closed out their defense was really strong they lost round three Round four, they technically had another clutch. It was Bosco in a 1v2, but really, like, he was going to win that round no matter what. He was basically playing, um, I think it was Smoke in Aviator behind the bar. He just, like, proned, and they, like, had zero time, so they had to, like, book it into sight. Mm -hmm. He was just there with a shotgun, like, boop, boop, right? So, it was, like, not as impressive as the first two, but still technically a clutch, right? Um, but they had really good, like, denial on the roam to, like, force it into that time. The last couple of rounds there, they had really good swings, good C4s. They played Library round six, which I still think is one of the strongest sites, probably the most underrated site in the game. It's way better than Trophy Statuary. People should play that site more. <laughs> SSG true. rocked it, and Empire had no shot. When we switched sides, right, SSG were up 5-1. Then it got to 5-5. Empire brought it back, and SSG looked to be crumbling. They were clumping up. They were getting shredded by C4s, shredded by swings. They were going very quickly, and I really think to a fault. They called attack timeout in round nine, lost one more round to be uh, put just up against the brink. And then SSG clutched up the last two rounds. They weren't clutches, but, you know, Skies had really good plant focus, I think, to, to end that out. Empire kind of peaking, uh, like, angles that they didn't need to that final round. I thought they played it a little over aggressive. Rampy had some top control that was really, really powerful to end out that game. So I think you can definitely criticize SSG some of their attacks, but I think the mental was kind of all over the place at that point. You know, they also had all of NA's hopes on their shoulders. Whether yeah. that actually affected them or they, you know, they cared too much, I don't know. But like, <laughs> you know, that was definitely uh, an intense game. The way it started, the way it finished, it felt very momentum driven. I wouldn't read into this game as like the peak SSG by any stretch of the imagination because there sure. were a lot of like sloppy attacks, particularly. But uh, yeah, I mean. Those were some clutches, really. That is the story <laughs> for this game. And it, it gave SSG enough momentum to the point where they were not going to lose this match after that. I'm happy that we got a dub, even though I am a little bit saddened by the fact that we won that game because it meant that we couldn't keep the 0 and 8 meme uh, going for any stretch of time or like, like, like the NA hasn't won shit or anything like that. But cool that they still got the dub under their belts. You got way more like cool games, I think, overall than I did, whereas I had a whole bunch of either oh, NA getting here. slaughtered or matches that weren't really as special as they could have been, like, like yeah. or like upsets or whatever. That game overall, I'm super happy they pulled it out, but at the same time, I'm still like, man, that would have been cool <laughs> if they lost. Anyway. That's a VOD review. That's a VOD review. Fair point. Good on SSG. And uh, those clutches are probably going to be replayed until the end of time. And Skies' face at, uh, after the rampy clutch was my face when I saw it. It was just like, <laughs> how did you do that? It was great. I, and I didn't think he could make that. Anyway, we closed out the day with one more game. I obviously, I, I sorry, admittedly didn't pay super close attention to this one because we were trying to make sure that every, everything for the post show was working as it was supposed to. But it was Furia mm -hmm. against Dom Juan. And they were playing on Coastline. This was a 7-4. I thought this would be another case where a Latam on Coastline usually equals a win, but this was yeah. the map that Dom Juan have allowed through the three permabands that they usually go for through the course of the year, which is as a reminder, this so far has been Cafe, Coast, and Clubhouse. And obviously when console got banned, uh, it, it, them playing Bank is something I'm wondering if they're going to allow through, but this is like their fourth map, so to speak. The one that they've they've said if it ends up getting selected then th there's not really a problem with it or like like a map that they end up playing they're cool with it because it's usually right. one that they permaban so they bring it out furia tries to set the pace as much as they can on both halves if it's on defense they want to run out they want to find an, uh, like a, a very early pick and set the tone if they're playing on attack they're trying to get into buildings quickly force people out of you know pretty obvious roam positions with like uh, irrespective of what side it is because you know if you're playing on a kitchen site you want to make sure that you have all of security and security hallway clear so they were trying to force entry there and it happened over and over again and Dalmon were just having none of it. They got a very early lead. I think it was like Furia were up 1-0, and then Dalmon kind of ran away with it at that point. The lead wasn't really ever close. I was really worried about Furia's coastline. It was just like, Dalmon were very comfortable here. Remember when they played it against Liquid and it was like an 8-6? We figured yeah. there was a chance they could take a map off of Liquid in a, in the, the quarterfinals. They came really close, and they had allowed this map one other time, I believe, in APAC North. Um, so they hadn't really shown all of their cards for it and Fury kind of walked into this and didn't really know like what to contend with uh the phrase coded is goaded should be noted here because <laughs> oh 
coded is goaded should be noted i actually hate the way that that You're works killing out. it i shouldn't yeah. be i I'm, I'm i'm a commentator for a reason but i'm trying to turn that part of my brain off um and this was another case where man count always seemed like it was pretty even like there was four four it was three three very often it wasn't a landslide in one team's direction like we've seen for a couple of very crazy blowout wins so far for today was not to be here if we have the stats of this game then you'll mention or you'll see what i mentioned about coded being goaded he was just he playing in a support role you don't expect him to get as many kills as he Ooh. did but he still did he had a phenomenal day i feel like this is a case where sometimes he's somebody who i wish wasn't on support because when he's let off the leash he can get like like a multitude of frags it's almost like he plays sabana very much like shiko used to way back in the day so mm -hmm. that's kind of what uh, where coded is kind of taking some of his inspiration overall and this performance also netted him the third highest overall rating for cgg for the major after the first day was wow. done it's dominated by brazilians and then coded is in third place so we've hyped yas up a lot we've hyped several other uh, other players to the moon like speakeasy but coded in the fray with a whole bunch of latsam players is honestly a super cool thing to see that's really, really impressive. The the one thing that's like my eyes are being drawn to here is probably at the bottom with fantasy. Yep. Going three and nine, zero and three opening. He literally carried the game for Furia when they beat Space Station Gaming. What the hell happened? This was a point I made from before. If Furia were going to have success, based upon how they played in BR six, it was because of fantasy. He had impact mm -hmm. frags. He was everywhere at once. I felt like there were some games in BR6 where he or the rest of his team was enabling him to succeed. They were enablers for the fantasy superstar show. That was what BR6 turned into. In this case, he simply wasn't allowed to get going. He took the brunt of, uh, of a lot of these entry engagements, even though overall his team had one more entry engagement than he did combined. But he was losing. And when he was losing, especially when they were in attacking uh, situations, which is where they went to on their second half, that's where I expected him to pop off, especially considering what he did in their first game when he played Finca primarily. He still did that in this game, but Dom1 said, we don't care. We have Rome set up like uh, in preparation specifically for fantasy. And that's kind of the problem. If you have someone who's breaking out into their own and like he tied a record with Paul Lu in stage three, which I thought was dope, <laughs> but he, he, he put a target on his back and everyone looked at his play style and said, we aren't going to give this any room to succeed. We'll shut this down early. It was a pretty concentrated effort to ensure that he couldn't get going he suffered it and furious suffered as a result twister couldn't really get them back into the game once damn one had a pretty considerable lead so yeah uh again i didn't watch this one super intently i would have we were just trying to make sure that the show was all set up but god damn wow. damn one is at the top of the group of death and i didn't predict them being here yeah somebody must have predicted them at the bottom how do we we don't have to dwell on who predicted them to get last in this group but no. that that wouldn't have been an unreasonable <laughs> prediction at the start of the major so well done to them jesse do you have something you want to tell us nope let's move on to predictions for day two jacob <laughs> yeah we can look ahead a little bit to day two and then uh actually you know what before we do that or whatever we have i just took a shot in the dark at what's next predictions we didn't have a graphic set up for for this time so i actually did gotcha. have something that i wanted to do instead uh because we're, we're hitting right around the hour and a half mark that we wanted to hit so we can wrap up after this if you had to pick let's say minimum two max three games from your stream that you would recommend people go back and watch again in as uh -huh. short a time frame as you can what games uh -huh. do you think or would you recommend people go back and watch if they couldn't catch all the games live today okay ssg empire number one that game was so fun go watch that lift up to the hype yep um following that i think probably i mean ssg furia was very back and forth as well had a lot of clutch plays um, and then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Sandbox Vitality if you're like if you're really into that APAC vibe. Okay. Um, as well as honestly, like Sandbox One maybe if you're really into that one vibe. Not really a great game between Sandbox and One. Mm -hmm. um, similar with that last one, but like some really like fun clutches um, from Team One and from Sandbox uh, in their Vitality game. So we'll go with that. All right. Uh, for me, I'll take Chiefs and Rogue. That was probably the best game that we had on Bravo stream all day. Not just because mm -hmm. it was a very even match overall, but there were still some cases like, like there was a lot of cap can, there were some traps, there were mistakes made by both sides. Don't get me wrong. But because of that, it turned this into a super even contest. It was an 8-7 win. It was down to the wire. I thought Chiefs were going to win. Uh, really, really good game. If you want to see uh, how IG were faring on Bank as well, you can go back and watch the game against NIP that I think they probably were on the verge of winning but this was also nip 
like working their way up mentally and making sure that they didn't like get themselves too down when they were down 5-1 after speakeasy was going like nuclear on their attacking half so that game is good and then for me just because i like this and it's kind of an anomaly of empire not really playing something that they go into as the weaker team their game against damwon on oregon that damwon won seven to three was like a master class of what not to do if you're team empire that goes against all the strategies that you know and how and how damwon can just like pick them apart piece by piece so for me it would probably be those three excellent good choices all right we are going to go ahead and wrap things up for the day we'll go through and make sure that we get the whole schedule uh, or the standings graphic figured out for next time but just as an overall refresher for where we sit phase clan are probably the big story because they didn't lose a single round they were 14 and 0 in both of their games in group a so that, that that's pretty wide open about who is going to qualify probably first from that match what else did we have that was really notable obviously okshi going to overtime dark zero not doing anything the rest of na sucking dick team one got six points space station That's empire well. was really good damn one got six points oh no was that a, was that a, a good enough think, summary think, on the day i think you nailed it all that was pretty well the day all right pretty well we had I was a long. I, I forgot how crazy it was to like to get back up at that time to, to watch video <laughs> games and then come on and do this. So it was yeah, fun. it was fun though. It was All right, a lot, of, a lot of fun games. It, well, you got a lot of fun games. I got a lot of games that mostly made me want to cry. <laughs> sure. I got some cry games we'll, too. We'll, I only had we'll call it I only fun. Had two games that were better than seven three. You got, I think. You got a couple more close games than me, technically. Uh, I, I mean, theoretically, yeah. I mean, but I am looking at how many of them were like 7-3, 7-3, 7-2, or 7-1, and just going, I, that could have gone better. But Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, that's true. We are going to go ahead and keep those streams consistent. Jess is going to keep on doing the ones from stream A. I'll keep doing the ones from stream B. Uh, and also something to bear in mind is that we do have these games running in parallel with one another. So if a group B game is happening on one stream, then the group B game is also happening on the other. So I think the schedule for today was it was like, what was it? It was A... It was A, C, B, and then D. So that schedule is going to be duplicated for what happens for the games on day three of the group stage on Wednesday. And then for tomorrow, I think it's it's not quite the same, but the, the idea is similar. Games will still be running in parallel based upon what group that they're in. So if you wanted to know what's happening in the other part of a group, then just go over to the Bravo stream or the mainstream, depending on where you are. And you'll be able to see how that stuff goes down. Tomorrow, there are, I think, a couple of implications for teams to get knocked out early, especially if they do really mm -hmm. poorly. Like the teams that didn't get uh, any points, like your Invictus, your Sonics, your Team Empires, and your Dark Zeros. Those teams, if they have really shit performances tomorrow, could get knocked out. And then teams, obviously, that have like one point, so an OXG or a Chiefs, those are the only two so far. The potential also does exist for them. And then qualifications for the teams that have six points would be your FaZe Clan, Team 1, BDS, NIP, and Damwon. So a lot of what playoffs can look like are the teams that qualify can shape up tomorrow. So that should be pretty exciting. Yeah, uh, a lot of surprises already. Group D looking like the group of death. Group C looking like the group of obviousness. Group B looking like the group between Sandbox and Vitality. And Group A looking like FaZe Clan and a bunch of just scraps fighting for the rest. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say what you want if you're a team, or keep on fighting for that number one seed <laughs> if you are kind of a shoe in make playoffs, because if you can get the, you'll get the easiest draw in the world of whoever's the number two seed coming out of Group A. So whatever you can do to get a number one seed, treat yourself a little bit and see if you can't get the opportunity to face them because that might just be the freest path to the semifinals that you're ever going to yep. get. But that'll do it for Jesse and myself for today. Thank you guys very much for showing up for day one of the post show. We will be back tomorrow relatively the same time because uh, tomorrow doesn't have a panel reveal. So it may be a little bit earlier depending on how games go, but it's the exact same idea right here on Twitch, right here on YouTube. Go to Jesse's Discord if you're interested in hopping in on the Pick'ems competition that goes on day by day. And if you're interested in a little bit of a preview for tomorrow, we have a guest coming on and that guest may or may not currently be in Sweden working on the major. So there's only a couple of people who it could possibly be. I'll let you theorize who it is, but thank you guys very much for showing up for day one of this edition of the post show. We'll be back tomorrow and uh, yeah, have yourselves a good night. Get some sleep. Take care.